All right, guys. Uh, I would like you to stop what you are doing now. Just pay attention for a few minutes. Uh, Nepal, I think it's just cut off for a minute. The intention is for me to communicate some coding practices uh, that you may grasp from reading a bunch of books on coding. Uh, you will never find it in the data science world. No one will tell you. But when you go to a company and start coding, uh, your boss is going to say things that you don't want to hear. So uh, better to kind of be a disciplined practitioner from the beginning while you are young, like everything else. Uh, when you are this young, it's easier to learn than when you have already been in the industry for five years and then people say, mm, I don't want to use that language here. So kind of, yeah, be careful. Uh, after this, I'm going to do a bit of coding also. And then we'll have a 10 minute, 15 minute break uh, before Mannath starts. I would recommend that you have the data loaded uh, before Mannath comes on stage. So you still have like an hour to do that should be plenty, right? Okay. So this next thing is about coding best practices. So I'll tell you some things from experience, right? And you may have not uh, done coding long enough. A lot of you are young to realize what I'm going to say. So you, who you write, who writes clean code, right? Clean code is difficult to write. Uh, you, you want to get the job done and move on to the next thing you want to do. Uh, in, at your stage in life, that may be a wide variety of things. At my stage of life, that's usually go and play with your kids, which may not be that interesting. So, but I'm sure you guys have much more interesting things to do than I have in my life. So you may want to just rush, finish your job, finish the damn assignment, finish the damn project, and go and have fun, right? But that's OK. For now, that's OK. But that's going to start, uh, it's going to distill a very bad practice in you guys, which will be hard to get off later. And I know, uh, ask my team, uh, they would tell you that how uh, painfully anal I am about when it comes to writing clean code. Googling stuff and finding some snippet on GitHub, copy paste that and copy paste this. And he said this on Stack Overflow. Let me write that also. And something else came to my mind. And this thing sounds logical, blah, 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 type, 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 type. By the end of it, I have 200 lines of code, right? Uh, 200 lines of code is good, uh, is manageable still, uh, because you are working on one small problem, uh, one small part of code that is supposed to do something small. But when you start building software and you start uh, making your code industrial, that's usually hundreds and hundreds, thousands lines of codes. Thousands and thousands of lines of code split across hundreds of files, right? Uh, it seems logical today. Five days later, it seems difficult to understand. And if I showed you your own code a year later, you wouldn't even recognize you wrote it. Unless you have a habit of naming variables in a very funny way, which only you understand. Uh, I can't understand my own code that I wrote two years ago. I look at it and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? And it is not new. It still happens. Doesn't matter how clean I code, still I forget what I was thinking at that point of time. You may think, ah, why, why not? I'll put. Long comments, I'll write a paragraph, I'll write essay with my code. Don't do that. People don't read it. Clean code means code which does not require comment. Clean code does not mean code that has hundreds of lines of comments with it. That is usually there if you want uh, some other members to start contributing to the code and you want the documentation to be within the code, you do that. But other than that, uh, try to avoid comment after every line. Just try to write code in a way when people are reading the code, they should be able to understand it. One more important thing that you have to consider is uh, refactoring, right? Who knows what refactoring is? Just put your hand up. Uh, I may need to explain that word or not. Refactoring. Okay, refactoring is I wrote something today, right? And uh, tomorrow I realize that ah, there is a better way to do it. So I go and Change my code, refactor, as in rewrite it. Make things simpler. One month later, I come back to my code. I realize, ah, this thing seems to be done in this way, could be done in this other way, which is better. I rewrite it. So the code that has been refactored a number of times is good code, right? And it gets simpler and simpler and simpler the way you refactor it, if you are refactoring it smartly. So remember to refactor your code to make it clean and easily understandable. And uh, 
I would suggest that you do it as a practical exercise. Write something today. Maybe next year I'll come back. And just the day before, I'd send out an email for you to read the code before you come and tell me how much you remember. So that's what I mean by clean code is code that can be understood down the road by you and other members who may be reading your code or checking your code, right? When you go to a company, no one will accept your code without some senior member checking it. So uh, if I look at code and I'm not able to read it and I have to call the person who wrote it, uh, that call doesn't end very well. So uh, it is better that I don't have to call. Whoever is your boss, if they don't have to call, much better. Just write code cleanly. Uh, so it starts with who cares about clean code? After a few days, I have no idea what I'm doing. And after a few months or a year, who in the God's name wrote that? So that I have seen that happen more than you'd like to believe. Okay, that's my first lesson. All the code that you'll see subsequently in the notebooks, we have tried to make it clean, easily understandable, not with shitloads of comments everywhere. Uh, but still, uh, it is hard to do. And uh, because you guys are relatively young, we did not want to make things overcomplicated as well. So we had that bound of keeping it simple and adhering to the basic concepts you may know. So that's part one. Now variable names, right? Uh, variable names. So uh, we don't care about them. It's like DF, final, my var one, A, X, Y, A, A, Y, Y, X, 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 Y, Y, Y. Those kind of variable names appear in code. DF, DF final, DF final two. Right? Uh, if, if you're doing, accessing a numpy array, NP array one, don't do that, please. Uh, I humbly request you not to do that. Uh, don't do it to yourself. Don't do it to your colleagues. Uh, think that uh, a variable name, when I say the variable name, it should tell me what it is. Uh, we are not programming in machine language anymore. You have enough characters to name your variables. Don't make it a sentence long, but at least kind of be, let it be itself explanatory, right? Python, fortunately, has a way, a Pythonic way to name your variables, so it's an underscore. Uh, don't put capital letters in there. That's not the Pythonic way of writing code. Just use an underscore, right? Uh, so that's the Python way. Functions, variable names should not have capital letters. I don't like to see them. That just shows that you don't know Pythonic way of doing code, and you just picked up the language. Use underscores, nice. And uh, class names, when you're defining classes, start with a capital letter. So when I'm reading your code, using it, uh, I don't have to worry about a lot of things. I see something which starts with a capital letter, I know it's a class. Uh, other things, I know it's a function or a variable, right? So this is a good way to name your variable. This is, could have been a nice way to name your variable. There is a way, if this u was small, then it's called camel case, which is how JavaScript or Java or C sharp names its variables. That's the convention they follow. They don't want to follow underscores. They follow like this. Never call your variable var1, right? So uh, I hope uh, if I ever see anyone's code from in this room, I have your email if we do talk. Uh, this thing really pisses me off. So if you have sent me a code which has this, don't send it to me. Then other thing is type safe your code. Eh? So this is one thing data scientists have no clue about. Uh, I did not know it uh, five years ago. What is type safety, right? Uh, how many of you know what a dynamically typed and a statically typed language is? Strongly typed and weakly typed language is? Yes. Do you know what's the difference? Anyone? Strongly typed language, can you name one? C, Java, C sharp, they are all strongly typed languages, which means that I have to define the type of the variable before using it. Those languages are usually compiled before running them. They are compiled to some intermediate machine code. Uh, in C, it could be a .c or .h file uh, that gets compiled into a .exe for Windows. Uh, it could be a Java code getting compiled into a jar file. So make sure your code is type. Uh, so those files are uh, first compiled and then run. Python is a funny language. 
uh, it is not compiled, it is interpreted at runtime. Uh, and this may be very kind of funny to you, but just remember what it means, right? Interpreted at runtime means till you actually hit a particular line of code, your code will not error, even if that code had that error sitting in it for years. Unless you actually hit the execution of that line through whatever execution flow, your code will not crash. It, because it is not compiled before, right? There is no way for the code to run that it should have crashed. Which means that the code you write and you don't test and goes up in some production code somewhere, it will error out when someone is trying to use it. Not you, someone else. Someone from the business user side of things. Someone, a geophysicist, a geologist, not who wrote the code. And they would have no idea why it crashed. And then uh, they will start cursing you, which we always do. So better to do this one hygiene, which is type safe your code. What that means is uh, Python supports a way to make it statically typed, which is called duck typing. Uh, I had a meme about it, but I think I removed it. Duck typing means type code like this. Uh, value colon int. So I'll just make it like this. This is how you would write C code, right? Int 32, int 64, float 32, float 64, and then kind of use it. Python also gives you the ability to duck type. JavaScript also gives you the ability to duck type. Uh, all the work that you see from here on, other than the very basics I'll touch about X-ray and Plotly, all the notebooks that you will see down the road, uh, at least from Mannat on data loading side of things, they are duct typed. Don't get confused. It is just to show you how duct type code actually looks like. Because what it would mean is uh, when you're calling your function and you're calling it with a wrong set of parameters, it will not let you call it. So, if, so a good example would be here, the meme. In Python, you can write this, a string multiplied sum with a string and a multiplication, right? So it will do something. But it is a very dangerous thing to do because Python will still give you an output of multiplication of a string with an integer and then addition back to a string. Uh, because it is doing type casting for you internally. It is a very dangerous thing to do in scientific code because uh, your code may be expecting an integer somewhere and then one day you pass a string to it and then the next two days you're debugging. So the way to stop doing it is every time you have a function, you kind of duct type it. I will show you how to duct type a function and just think about it, right? Uh, so I'll do a bit of coding here just to show you what duct, duct typing actually looks like. Uh, there is, in this notebook, there is a link to Pydantic. So Pydantic is coming from very clever folks. It's a library which will guide you towards what duct typing is, okay? I will touch more on this in the afternoon when I speak because a lot of the code that you see, right, you, we are always using our browser for something, right? All the work that we do, whether it's emails, docs, everything is in the browser now. How does that happen? It happens because there is a web application in the browser that is sending something to the server, and then it is doing something and sending back to you something you wanted. Now, all the logic, all the code is sitting on a server somewhere else, and you want to communicate with it. So it has to understand what you are sending to it, and it has to understand what it is getting back what you are expecting to get back. There also, this duct typing is very, very important. For now, I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but I would highly encourage you to at least in the next few days, while you are looking at our notebooks, try to go through this library. It's called Pydantic. Okay. Uh, I wish I knew this a few years ago. Now I know this. My team knows it and I hope you guys also start using it. Uh, you would see that your code is suddenly going to become much easier. And see, imagine, remember when I spoke about naming your variables, right? Each variable that you try to use in your code is also occupying some memory in your own head to remember what you called it. Uh, if you have used VS Code or any other code editor, you, are, you have the ability to autocomplete. By putting a dot, it autocompletes for you. If you have not, you'll, you can, you'll see what I mean later on. 
just putting a dot auto completes your code. It tells you what can come next, right? Duck typing variables in Python will give you that superpower of not having to type everything, but just put a dot and you will get a list of things to auto complete. And you can just select what you want, move on. I don't have to remember anything because I put a dot and everything else comes after it. I'll show you how to code that, right? So that's one thing. Uh, yeah. So let's do some basic stuff here. So I'll execute this cell. Uh, have you heard of data classes in Python? Has anyone heard of data classes? No. So base model is just a uh, high level data class. Data class is a way in Python where you can create getters, setters, and variable names and everything. So it's a good thing to have. Base model is a data class. It gives you a lot of powers. Uh, so let me see if this code executed. Yeah. So this code executed, right? So first of all, I'll tell you how a good function signature looks like. Okay. Uh, I can name a, I can give a value a type and a default value. Right? I can say a is an integer and its default value is 6. I cannot say this. Hopefully. Code risk of live coding. I may be proven wrong. No. You can't do that. Uh, maybe this. Maybe this will work, right? A is type of an integer, which is set to 1. And later, if I try to do A equal to this, will it work? Hopefully not. If, ah, this still works. So Python still kind of overshadows that. But within the base class, you won't be able to do it. So if I had a base model here, you won't be able to do this. So what I want you guys to do is create a class right name name your class so uh, my test class so again my test class my test class and inherit from base model am i visible on the screen can you read that okay and then give this class a property of the type of int and set it to 1 I want you to follow along, otherwise you won't be able to see what I mean next. So when I do this now, uh, my new class instance is equal to my test class with a equal to 5. my test class a equal to 5, right? Then I should be able to do my new class instance dot, hopefully, uh, this would have appeared in VS Code. Uh, X, mm, in, in, in S T A I N S instance dot VS code would have auto completed it yeah a so I don't if I if I group my variables into a class then I don't re need to remember them again I can just put a dot Jupyter collab takes two or three seconds if you were actually coding I hope you would be coding in VS code one day VS code or uh, PyCharm or any other ID just by putting the dot, a list will appear immediately. And then I can just select and move on. So I don't have to remember. And I cannot set it to a wrong type. It will not let me do it, hopefully. It still lets me do it, but at least in the Pythonic API manner it won't. So this, this, this piece of code is just declaring the right classes. Uh, showing you how to kind of go about doing it. Uh, string is in string, str, int is an in int, there is list, optional, union, any is, it could be anything optional, you don't really need to fill it. List is a list, and base model is a base model. So let's try to create a class. First exercise is create a class 
with three type of objects, three properties. One of them should be a string type, one of them should be an integer type, and one of them should be a list. Let's see. Take two minutes to do it. You can try. Create a new class, inherit from base model, like here. And create three properties, like this has a single property value. Create three properties. Type, type of one should be a string, one should be an integer, and one should be a list. Maybe make it a list of strings, if you fancy. So let's just try to do it. Uh, some warm up. No, no. So I have an example for you here, those who have still not been able to do. And I will show you the constructor of this. So just have a look at this example, right? and I will new create a new instance. So this is the declaration of the class. It's not an instance of the class. So let me create a new instance of this class and show you one more superpower. New, my new class instance equal to my underscore new class this. It will give you all the type suggestions here. So property should be a string. Property int should be an integer. Property list should be a list of strings, right? And then if you try to do it, property uh, p e r t y int equal to h p e r o p e r t y underscore int equal to h, it won't like it. It won't let you do that. So it says there is a validation failure. A property int was supposed to be an integer, but it is not an integer. This means that your code will fail before runtime, before it actually hits the use of that class. Whichever piece of code was trying to use it will not actually be able to use it. So then you can start passing your errors up the hierarchy. Uh, uh, most of that work today is done by calling an API. Uh, endpoint. So the API endpoint is where you should be able to stop and not start troubling your computers with code that is going to ultimately fail. So that's an important thing. I would not uh, dive a lot more into this because Mannath anyways has all her code written in this style, so you'll get to see a bit more there. But the intention is if you write type safe code, it will not fail at runtime, it will fail before and I'll also show you an example of how to write a type safe function. So just, just pay attention to what I'm doing on the screen. So definition of my function which expects an input A which is of the type of integer and an input B which is of the type of string and gives me an output which is of the type of boolean. And it takes return if, let me also just say int then it should be able to do if a equal to equal to b then return true else 
return false right very simple example but what it shows you here is uh, wherever i am or maybe i true is not defined uh, how do i write true with a capital t true and false yeah so this is going to tell anything that is going to use my function that a and b need to be integers and it has to return a boolean value to me right if i were trying to return this then what would i be returning can someone put your hand up and tell me what modification i need to make anyone can put their hand up come on guys just simple one line of modification now it will be a list of all right guys uh, can i have your attention again i think most of us are here uh, i'll wait for a couple of more minutes for people to settle down in the meantime just summarize what we saw so i told you how not to code uh, you came here to learn how to code and do ai ml which we haven't touched so far i definitely told you how not to code a bit about resolutics a bit about the discussion on the workshop uh, so now we are going to actually start going into the scientific part of it warm up is kind of done uh, why uh, i wanted to introduce you to some of the concepts that we discussed before is because the code that you are going to see now and mannat and nipul show a lot of it will have very funny notations so if you did not know what i was going to if i did not tell you what duck typing was was pythantic was then uh, you would look at that code and go like it is not how python code is supposed to look like so that's why it is good to orient and uh, also will reinforce those uh, basics that we learned again through our notebooks okay so this session is uh, the first actual technical talk about analytics that we are going to start with and uh, i'm going to just take half an hour more i because i kind of went a bit uh, overboard in terms of the clean code part so we are going to cut down on the plotly demo i'm going to redirect you to the website uh, but this particular talk i'm going to focus around uh, the data structures that are optimized for machine learning and all the data that you are going to see uh, nipul use in his machine learning talk is going to be in this x ray format and manath is going to show you how to convert the data from uh, the industry standard format for enp data which is like a segwy or a las file or a text file into this machine learning format called x ray so uh, what i want to do before i hand it over to manath is to tell you about x ray why we are going to use it and what are the challenges when it comes to using data in machine learning right so here is the first one all of us like to process big data right that's the key thing we want to process big data even if we don't understand what big data is we still want to process it so and we want to process lots of it right big data is big right so uh, there are a lot of challenges so i'm going to name the challenges they are not in the notebook but just for you to think about one what happens to the data if what happens if the size of the data is bigger than the ram that you are using your one single computer won't be able to process it or you can't keep it in ram because if you have a 32 gig ram which is trying to process a 100 gig data set it won't work so that's first challenge second challenge is your data may have very complicated uh, relationships between them and you want to access data by those relationships so you want to keep some sort of sql like database underneath and you want to keep your data structure data files also that's another challenge then uh, what happens if you want to use your data to run 100 machine learning experiments on it to do some hyperparameter search you have to access it in parallel right uh, if i try to read the same data sitting in one place on the disk 100 different programs are trying to read it it's going to slow it down because there is a finite bandwidth available between your uh, hard disk your ram and your cpu right there is uh, limitations there so all of those things are there and other than that uh, 
when we are trying to access uh, numpy arrays, right? How many of you are familiar with numpy arrays at least? Yeah, that I expected a lot, right? You can do a notation like a square bracket dot dot something, right? And you will be able to access some part of that numpy array based upon the index uh, that you want to slice it on. So I'm going to start there. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about this X-Array format. Have you, how many of you have heard of X-Array before? One, okay. Net CDF or HDF5? Yeah, good. Which department are you guys from? Earth Sciences. Earth Sciences. Doing PhD? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll start with NumPy Array and I'll show you some problem. So, I'll, cre I'll start this notebook. This notebook is 003 X-Array and Plotly. I would like you to open this notebook on your computers also, on your collab, and start with me, right? So let's just import NumPy. Uh, make a nice NumPy array called my array equal to np dot random dot random of, uh, maybe make it 10 comma 10 comma 10, 10 comma 11 comma 12. Let's make an array like this. So I'm making a three-dimensional array uh, of the shape 10 cross 11 cross 12, right? Uh, taking a bit of time to do it, but that's okay. So uh, just an announcement. So Abhimanyu is, is all for clean code and for keeping the doors closed at all times. How to exit? There's a, a sticker called push. So push that door and you can get out and, and the door closes it on, on itself. If you push the door that's next to the door that says push, then it all falls apart. The doors don't close in on itself. So please, let's follow this so that we remain master. Sorry. Okay. So my array was created. Uh, and then I want to take the first slice from my array. So I would do something like this. So it will take, along this dimension, it will take the first index. And along the other two dimensions, it will take everything, right? So what, do, what would the shape of this be? Can anyone tell me what would the shape of this be? 10 cross 11, yeah. Or 11 cross 12, what would be the shape? What would be the shape of this? 11 cross 12, because I have taken one slice along this dimension and I have taken all the points along the other two. So the shape will be of this. What would be the shape of this? Ten cross twelve. And the shape of this? Ten cross eleven, right? So at least you guys know when I am trying to slice it, how am I going, right? What would, the, what would be the shape of this? Five cross six, right? But you see, uh, when I went want to get a particular set of data out of this array, I need to know the indexes. Uh, that is a very very poor way of accessing the data, especially when it comes to seismic data or your well data, because your seismic data, if it's a 3D cube, will have the dimensions called inline and crossline, which is along the survey perpendicular to the survey. Your well log will have a dimension in depth or in time. So every time you want to get a particular piece of data out of it, whether it's a particular inline, it's a particular cross line, it's a particular short, uh, it's a particular uh, depth value, depth range in a well log, if you were to go and address it by this indexing, then you will need to write the function that converts your depth to an index value and then slice it slices on the index, right? So that's all good as long as you don't have to access it randomly and access it in a controlled fashion because then there has to be a mapping between the human readable label of the index, what is the index called and uh, how do I then slice it, right? So for this particular problem, uh, to address this particular problem, which is accessing high dimensional arrays 
or slicing data out of it, a concept was invented called a dimensional container. So this is, now we are starting to go into machine learning, right? What is a dimensional container? This, the image shows you a dimensional container. So here, you have the NumPy array that we spoke about, the 3D array sitting as the 3D cube. And then you also have, for each of the axes, you give it a label of the axis. You tell it what the axis is. Uh, index 0 could mean inline 100. Index 2 could mean inline 101, right? Uh, in terms of depth, index 0 could mean 2,500 meters. Index 1 could mean 2,501 meters, right? So each of the indexes actually in your data always have a human readable label. And when we are writing our programs, we want to access the data using our human readable labels rather than the index. And we want some program to take care of that for us automatically. That particular program is called X-Array. X-Array is an API only. It's not a data format. It's an API. API is application programming interface. So it gives you the ability to access multidimensional arrays in a very nice manner. And you can store a lot of arrays on the same kind of index and you can access them very, very easily. I'll show you that, I'll show you that in code. So say you had a map of, uh, if you had a cube, and I kind of calculated some uh, average value along e on this direction, so I would only get one single plane, right, of this cube, because I've averaged on this direction. So that could be this plane. Another one could be standard deviation if I calculate for all these samples. Then again, for the whole of this direction, I will get only one value. And one value at each of the slices, right? each of the points in space. So anytime I do an aggregation, I can reduce a dimension on my data and kind of still keep the data on the same axis so that it's easy to correlate, easy to access. X-ray gives you that capability, right? Each of these things, each of the variable, data variable, and this coordinate system of reference, X, Y, Z, could be whatever you call it, and its coordinates, the actual values, make a data array. And if you put a lot of data arrays together, it makes a data set. So when we speak about data set from here on, remember we are talking about a high dimensional container of the data, which has the data variable itself as a NumPy array, mostly a floating point NumPy array. We have the dimensions and the coordinates, the name of those dimensions. And we'll call it an X-array data set. That is what you are going to be using in your machine learning projects that we show. I'm going to discuss, uh, I'm going to make an X-ray right in front of you. You can code along, okay? So you can look at my screen and code along. That's absolutely okay. It's not a quiz. So let me make some dimensions. Okay, so dims, I'm going to make a three-dimensional array, okay? And my three-dimensional array are going to have three dimensions called X, Y, and Z, okay? Dims. I'm just going to show you how to do it. So my data has three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, okay? Just like this, X, Y, or T. Could be T also. Let's just keep it Z for the moment. Then I'm going to give a coordinates. Coordinates are a dictionary. So they have to be defined like this. So X is, let's say, MP dot A range uh, of, uh, or let me just make a list here. It will be much easier. Uh, I for I in uh, range 10 to 21, okay? And then we have Y, Y kind of follows the same logic. Um, let's make it 22, actually let's make it 20 to 32. And then make it 21. I'll be able to illustrate better. 21. And then for Z, we'll do the similar thing. And this time we are going to name it um, 32, 10 to 22, 31, and 32, 41. Okay. And I'm going to create a data variable called data equal to np dot random dot random 
can someone tell me what is the size of each of this x, y, and z? What is the size of x? What is the length of x? Anyone? 10? Are you sure? Any takers for 11? Any takers 11? 11? What is the length of y? 11? 10 or 11? Who says 10? Put your hand up. People are afraid. I, I, I was hearing 10. Who says 11? Okay, can we validate? Try to validate. How would you find the length of x? Length of? Let me just execute this cell first. And then let me go into another cell, which is length of coordinates of x. 11, OK? Kind of the other two are also 11. So let me make a data array, which is np.random.random dot dot of 11, 11, 11, right? Let's do that. OK. So see, we spoke about three things here. The data variable itself, the coordinate axis names, and what each of these cells actually belong to. So these all three x, y, and z have indexes between 0 to 11. There are 11 indexes. If I was going in the NumPy world, the shape of the data is 11, 11, 11. And if I wanted to extract the second slice along the first dimension, how would I do? I would do data 1, comma is 2, comma is 2, right? This will give me the first slice along this dimension. But what second slice along this dimension? But what would be the x value for it? x value would be 1 or 11. What would the second x point be? It would be 11, right? What would the second y point be? 21. What would the second z point be? 31. So essentially, if I want to extract the value at x equal to 11, in the conventional world, I would have to do this. If I wanted to extract the value along x equal to 17, what would I have to do? Come on, quickly. 17. x 17. I can make it a bit. x equal to 17. 8. See, it becomes complicated, right? Because you have to think, and then we are not sure. What if I told you there is a way where I can put x equal to 8 and get it? That's, that's what x-ray does for you. So let me kind of get rid of this. Import the x-ray, or execute the cell. Import x-ray. So this is like you exp import numpy as np. We import x-ray as xr. XR is auto loaded in your uh, Jupyter environment for Collab. Now let me show you how to create an XR, right? So let me create an my XR data array equal to XR dot. I mean, they dot karne se, you should be able to get some hint, yes. And then dot day e -A -T -A, data. This is why I don't like collab so much, because it's kind of this two seconds adds up throughout the day. Data array. What does capital D mean? What, what did I tell you in the last lecture? If something starts with a capital letter, what is it? Class. So it's a class. All the Python things that you get from professionals will follow that logic. So I know it's a class. Class requires a constructor. So what is the constructor signature? Just hover over it. It requires a coordinates, it requires some attributes, it requires some dimensions, and what else does it require? Data. Right? So let's do that. Data equal to data, because I created like that. Uh, dims equal to dims, which are my dimensions. So dimensions are x, y, and z, and coordinates is coordinates. And see, it also in the, in the help document, you see, if, you, if your code was written correctly, right, what does it show? If I just hover over it again, it shows data can be anything. Coordinates have to be a sequence. 
or a dictionary and a dims has to be a hashable thing. Hashable thing means it has to have unique values. So unique values, a list which has unique strings in it, unique numbers in it is hashable. So that's a hashable list here. Coordinates is a dictionary and data is data. So when I do this, I create my X-ray data set. Oh, should have imported that. It is that easy, okay? So before you can create a data set, you need to know the dimensions of the data, as in the access names, what is the range on each access the data is going, human labels for them, because if I were to draw this on a plot now, then I will put 11, 12, 13, 14 to 21 here, and here I would put 31, 32, 33. If I'm making plots, my labels should have those values in them. My labels should not have indexes in them. No one would understand. So now, easy enough is, this is easy, okay? Now, if I can, I'll show you how to access this in detail uh, down the road on another slide. But remember, I told you, you should be able to access it very, very quickly. My XR data array dot select x equal to So now the whole slicing operation, that was that funny notation in NumPy, which was uh, data, square bracket start. For index 18, what would be the value? Nine. I, I'll, I'll take your word for it. This. This is what you would have done before. I don't know whether you have done it correctly because I still don't know whether 9 is the right index. And imagine having thousands of indexes. You would make a small calculation mistake and use the wrong data. But here, look at the syntax. From my X-ray data set, select X equal to 18. And it gives you a two-dimensional array as an output with the size 11 comma 11, where this is the data, and these are the x coordinate is 18, y coordinate is all of these, z coordinate is all of this, right? Very easy to do. I could have done slice in another direction, uh, y equal to 25. The same kind of logic applies. I don't have to do calculation in my head, I can easily select. And I can do a dot cell again if I wanted to reduce along another dimension, okay? So this was just party trick because we are going to do a lot of this in the exercise again. Let me just show you how this looks. So can you just type this, my X-ray data, and just run it? So you should be seeing something like this on the screen. I'll make it a bit big, uh, zoom in a bit. So see, X-ray data set has attributes, which I did not discuss so far, has indexes, the dimensions, and the grid on which the data is sitting. So all X-ray data sets will look like this. And if I simply do a dot dims on it, It will give me the dimensions that the data is sitting on it. If I do chords, then it will show me the coordinates of my data in each direction. And if I did dot data on it, it will give me the numpy array back. So it's easy enough to extract the numpy array, also know x and y of the data or z and slice it, right? So that's the power what x-ray gives in a nutshell. There is so much more, 
But in for today's discussion, I think this is where you can start thinking about why this is. And then a dimensional data set, right? So I discussed, this is a single data array. So what we are seeing here is just one of these cubes sitting on this three-dimensional axis where x goes from 20 to 31, y goes from 11, 10 to 21, y goes from uh, 20 to 31, and z goes from 30 to 41, right? So that is the data that we saw, and a single three-dimensional cube stored on it. Now, what, what if I want to store one more piece of information where one, one of the dimensions is not there? So this dimension was not there. I just wanted to store on the same grid something just had x and y, right? So that's easy enough to do also. Let's try to do that. So let's try to do some, let's create a data set with only two dimensions, x and y, random data, and try to create a data array yourself. Go ahead. Five minutes. You should, look at, you should be able to look at this code and just create a two-dimensional version of this. But keep x and y the same. I'll also code it. So, Unless you started browsing something else, this should have been plenty time. You could have copy pasted what I wrote on the top and just modified it also. So I'll move on because we are short on time. You really want to get into the machine learning stuff. So this is the new X array we created. You can look at the code on the screen. Just two dimensions, two coordinate grids, two dimensional array, and the same syntax. Okay. And now look at this again in the same way we were exploring before. So now only two coordinates exist, x and y, and the data is like that, indexes are different. Okay. So we can do something new now, which is my x array data set equal to xr dot data. Give it a minute. Set and data set takes in a dictionary. So uh, my 3D data is the first array that I created. 
which is this one. And my second array is my 2D data is my 2D array. Hope this works. Yeah, this works. Okay. So now in the same data set, I have stored two kind of data things. One is a three dimensional array, one is a two dimensional array, but they are sitting on the same coordinate axis. And if I now look at this, just click on C, uh, just look at how this one looks. So you see, it says I have three dimensions, x, y, and z. I have coordinates for each of them. I have two data variables, my 3D data and my 2D data. And my 3D data sits on x, y, and z grid. And my 2D data sits on x and y grid. And then I should be able to see all the data points that are there also. And there are three indexes that it has stored. So what, what this is equivalent to, this is equivalent to one of this and one of this sitting on this three-dimensional grid. Now I could just add one more if I wanted to. That is something you guys can do. You can create, not now, not now, we are short on time, but you can create another 3D grid. As long as they are sharing dimensions, uh, they will sit. If it is a new dimension altogether, it will create a new dimension set for you. Right, if, if the new dimensions were x, y, and t, something that I don't have in my data set, then it will create a new dimension in the data set. And for your new data array, it will try to make it sit on it. So that's, that's how x arrays work. They are giving you ability to put your data in a container, which has information about its labels also, makes life easier to access. And then there are some other benefits, which I'm not going to touch upon is you can compress the data while you're storing it and accessing it. Uh, you can interpolate it on the fly. You can do moving average calculations on it. For those who are working in uh, meteorology or meteorological things related to earth science, for them, this data format is created for them only. So they started creating this data format. It was created at NASA, uh, Environmental Observatory somewhere in the US. So uh, this is also cloud ready. So if you are going to store data like this, in the cloud somewhere, then a lot of people will be able to access it. There is a czar library that does that for you. Uh, at Resolutix, all our internal data for machine learning and AI, uh, it gets through a con format conversion process where we are reading the data. And then in our internal platform, all the data sits like X-arrays. So that's something we do as a practice. Other companies have their own proprietary format. Uh, for us, it's a version of X-array we use internally. Uh, makes uh, life confusion free. So we already saw how would slice a data set, right? I will tell you how to slice a data array. We saw how to slice, right? I'll show you how to slice a data set. So if I was going to ask you to give me slice number 13, x equal to 13 from this, what would it be? It would be very simple. Again, my x array data set, choose the data set. It's like a dictionary. Choose the name of the array. So what was the name of my 3D array? Uh, my 3D array was called just my X-array data. Then I would do a dot select on it, and X equal to 17. My XR data during the handling of this, this happened. Can you tell me how to fix this? Did anyone else get it to work? Bilkul say whoever whoever said that did the right thing. So I should be able to access it like this because in the dictionary it is stored like like this. So dictionary the container has this name for it. Okay. So imagine you had 100 wells. I'm giving you a hypothetical scenario, which you are going to encounter very soon. You had four, five, seven wells. Each of them had well logs. 
at different depths and I wanted to do a process where I only wanted to use five of them out of 100 and between a particular depth zone. Uh, in the current world, if you were to do it without X-ray, you would be making data frames for it, then having making a dictionary of data frames or by name or something and then you will try to convert with some function logic where depth is for each of those, extract the indexes to prepare that single data frame which you will then use for machine learning. With X-ray, all of that is gone. Just get the data in an X-ray and I should be able to choose which well I wanted to use or which wells I want to use and select a particular depth range from it. So this is something we are going to show when we speak later. But remember, when you get the data into an X-ray, it is simply get me from my data set this particular data and select these values from it. Very human readable, very manageable. I would highly recommend that all of you go through the documentation of X-ray, look at its capabilities, and when you start thinking about data analytics from now on, don't just be limited to pandas, don't just be limited to using numpy arrays, get into a habit of using X-rays, you can thank me later for that. So yeah, that's one thing. So this is all in memory, right? I told you X-ray is just a memory thing, it's just an API to access something that is stored somewhere. So how do you store this data on disk now? Uh, because I created this beautiful data format, uh, showed you this, but now this has to go on disk somewhere also, stored, stored as a disk file. For that, we have something called uh, HDF5. HDF5, uh, you can click the link, the notebook has a link for it. Um, something has happened. Alternate F4, control or delete, task managers, okay. Can I recover? No, I can't recover. Just give me one second. I'll come back to this notebook. Uh, Sorry about that, not sure what happened. New notebook, upload notebook, upload, choose file, oh, excellent plotly. Okay, so we were here. You can click on the link. Hopefully your system doesn't break like mine. Uh, so HDF5 is a way to store this data, the metadata, the SQL-like relationships, everything into a single file. That would be an HDF5 file. But we can do one better. So you, you should be aware of this format because it is one of the de facto big data formats that everyone uses. And if you look under the hood for any big data format, you would see HDF5 somewhere. Uh, surprising that people don't know about it. Uh, Google also released something very similar called TensorStore recently. Not sure if you're aware of that. So do check that out also. Then we have this format called NetCDF, which is a further version on top of HDF5 uh, which is a portable network shareable format and it is much more powerful than uh, NetCDF itself. Uh, community supported, very well used. So what I would do is I would create an X-ray and I will show you how to, I will not go into a lot of detail, you can read that, it will be too much theory. But what it gives me is the ability to access data randomly very easily, uh, make it shareable by other users on the cloud, anywhere else. So I will try to create an X-ray and save it on disk, show you how to do it, right? For other people, uh, you can just try to do it yourself now. So should be able to do, let me just rewrite that code. dims equal to x comma y called, yeah, chords equal to a dictionary of x, is i for i in 
range 0, 10 for me this time around and y is in the range of same one I will make and then data variable will be np dot random dot random of 11 10 comma 10 right 10 comma 10 right 0 to 10 yes that's some funny business with my d always type it twice okay and i have to kind of import x-ray again import x-ray as xr import numpy as np this should be able to work So, next step I could do is um, uh, xr data equal to data array equal to xr dot data array of coordinates is coordinates, dims is dims and data is data and then I should be able to do xr underscore data set equal to xr dot data set and I can give a dictionary of my data set is my data set is made up of just my data array. Hopefully, this also runs. Yeah. So, now I can uh, write it to disk which is a simply easy, simply simple step xr dot data set. I would recommend you mount your drive like this. And then X-ray data set dot two two file right two file right to save two net CDF and whatever path you want to give path to file dot NC. So, you should be able to do this single thing and it will export your x-ray data as a rest net cdf file very very quickly. To, to read it back is xr dot open data set now and open data set just have to type the path of the data set here wherever you have saved and then also there is a method called xr dot load data set. Open data set will just give you access to memory pointers. It will not load the data in RAM. O load data set will load the data in RAM. Remember th the difference. If you have a 50 gigabyte data set, you do not want to load data set. You simply want to open it. Then you, whatever data you slice and get from it, only that is loaded in RAM. In load data set, everything is loaded in RAM. Where bad practice with X-ray, you don't need to load data in RAM when it is on disk. Just try to use open data set, right? Uh, so that's I'm not going to go into details with this. Interchange with pandas is also okay. Uh, just last bit from me before I hand it over to Manath is Plotly library. I would have loved to go in detail on it, but I don't have the time. I'll just tell you the advantages of it over Matplotlib and other libraries and then kind of let you do it. Manat and Nipul are going to show some plots using this anyways. Uh, otherwise, in the end, if I have time still left, I'll show you an app. So, the advantages of Plotly over Matplotlib, why you should use it is it makes beautiful plots. It makes plots which you can interact with on the screen. So, I'll show you a plot. In, in, in Matplotlib plot, you can't zoom. In this, you can zoom, whether it's a notebook, web app, 
and you can do a lot of things. You can annotate on the screen, you can select a region, you can select a point, it's interactive. All plots done in Plotly are interactive. You can hover over things to get values. And these are very simple plots to make. So I think syntax wise, this is the simplest plotting library. Make sure you learn this library in your life. Everything will be better and your plots are going to look so much better. The styling is so much better. So it has all sorts of plots. Uh, I will just give you a teaser. So Plotly has, it has compatibility to all libraries. So you can have the Plotly version for Python, R, Julia, JavaScript, MATLAB, everything. And uh, plotting an image is kind of just a one single syntax, IM show, gives you a nice image, and an image where you can zoom. But you see this pixelated when I zoomed, maybe not so clear, uh, it pixelated. If I had the time, if I have the time in the evening, I'll show you how to not pixelate it while zooming. So, yeah. All the documentation is very, very nice. Uh, that was step one. Why? Makes beautiful plots, makes interactive plots. Third, when you are going to make a web application, you would want to make plots, scientific plots on the web also, on the browser. Matplotlibs don't render on browser. If you try to do a matplotlib in a browser, it will render as a static image. No one will be able to interact with it. That's 1980s, 1990s, I would say, for us. We don't want to do that. So this particular matplotlib figures can be interchanged with a web app technology called Dash. So that is what we are going to share code with you. So if you are going to do your scientific analysis, you can write a Dash application, which is a web application, and your all the scientific plots that you want to show on the screen can come from the Plotly library. Make sure to start using it. The earlier you do, it will be better. Uh, there is another library called Seaborn. Uh, if not sure if you have heard of it. Seaborn is also good. Bokeh is also good. But for me, Dash and Plotly do the thing right now. So Again, at Resolutix, uh, all our scientific plots that you see on any of the platforms, any of the applications are all done in Plotly. Uh, yeah. Documentation is superb, right? So you should be able to just click on any plot and look at all the code and everything. I think I have taken more time than I was supposed to. Uh, I'll stop here. Only three or four takeaways before you now go dive into the data loading and machine learning. Write clean code. Make everyone's life easier. Start using X-ray. You'll be happy. Thank me in the long run. Start using Plotly. You'll make beautiful plots that you will like. And the people you share your reports, presentations, they will also appreciate that. So three things. X-ray for big data, Plotly for plots, and good coding practices, learn to code. Because a data scientist ultimately has to code also. All right, I'll take a, I'll close my session here. Uh, maybe just break for two minutes. If you want to use the washroom, have a glass of water. And then Manath will start the data loading bits after that. So,